Welcome, everyone. Rick Cole here, and you are listening to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. We come to you each week from the beautiful Niagara region of Ontario, Canada, bringing you all the big news stories in the hockey and sporting worlds from 50 years ago this week. This time around, we're looking at the first week of June, that's June 1st to 7th, 1970. This podcast is made possible by the support of our two sponsors, Newspapers.com, the world's largest online newspaper archive, is uh, helping us uh, so much with our research, providing us access to all the newspapers in hockey land in the 1970s. We are also sponsored by the Breakwall Brewing Company located in beautiful downtown Port Colborne, Ontario. The folks at the Breakwall, even during the pandemic, are producing outstanding craft beers, many of which are from recipes crafted in an original brewery in Port Colborne in the 1800s. When this pandemic is over and things start to return to some sort of normal, I'd love to meet any of our listeners at the Breakwall in Port Colborne for a beer and some wonderful pub food. In last week's show... Uh, some of the stories we discussed were, well, the biggest story was the tragic death of all-star Hall of Fame NHL goalkeeper Terry Sawchuk. We talked about the legal battle to determine once and for all the ownership of the Oakland Seals and how it seemed that that story was never going to have a conclusion. And we learned that the arena renovations in Buffalo to Memorial Auditorium suddenly and unexpectedly came to a halt. But everything seemed okay to the new Buffalo Sabres and the reason for the stoppage was something that actually was quite routine. This time around as we get into the week before the NHL summer meetings which are uh, really scheduled to be something uh, historic for the league with the expansion to Buffalo and Vancouver we have a lot of off-season news to talk about. Uh, We'll get more details as they became available on the death of Terry Sawchuk. We'll also talk about some new NHL rules that are really quite intriguing and as we learn of this proposed rule 50 years ago we might see it uh, it could be applied to today's hockey as well. We'll learn of a decision reached in California in that ongoing trial to determine ownership of the Oakland Seals But would that be the end of the story? And we find out that the Stanley Cup champions have a brand new coach and we'll tell you who he is. We'll also have the news and rumors as teams prepare for the upcoming expansion and amateur drafts. So with all this news to get to, let's get to it. First of all, this week, uh, I, I don't like to delve into the real world that often because I I view our project here as something of an escape for all the negativity and the bad stuff that's going on in the world today. Uh, this is a diversion that I enjoy to do. Uh, real life this year entails far too much that uh, we don't want to deal with. I myself are finding it particularly difficult to start start writing the scripts this week with all the things going on uh, in our world and in the United States in particular. Uh, Many of you may know uh, I was a uh, police officer. That was my uh, career for the biggest part of my working life. Uh, But during that career, I took it upon myself to get educated in the area of anti-racism. I did this in the 1990s, and I studied and gained experience to the extent that I have been qualified as an expert witness in the the field of anti-racism and several other areas as well by the Superior Court of Ontario. I've maintained a strong interest in these issues ever since, and I try to stand up for what's right whenever I can when I see something going on that's not right. So what's happening now with Minneapolis and other cities burning as I record this, 
uh, TV uh, reporters of color being arrested right in the middle of broadcasting a story while their white counterparts go free at the same scene. This is all very troubling to me. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I truly hope that we can all come together someday as one race, the human race, and that the forces that are causing and promoting this division in our society can once and for all be eradicated. It isn't going to be easy. We all have to stand up for what is just and what is right. That's what I try to do every day, and I'm going to continue to do so. If you don't like this, tune out. I don't need you as a listener. I don't do this for profit. I do this for fun. Uh, It's not fun what's going on in the world today. And I'm going to try and make it more fun for myself in any small way that I can. So we start off today's news with what was, of course, the biggest story in 1970, the death of goaltending great Terry Sawchuk. News of Terry's passing broke on Sunday afternoon and was still circulating around the hockey world on Monday as people woke up to the reports of Terry's demise. It seemed everyone had questions about how and why this tragedy could have happened at all. Now the Long Island police became involved early on before Terry had succumbed to his injuries and statements were issued while he was recovering in hospital that he had been injured in a brawl, a wrestling match, horseplay or whatever you want to call it with housemate and hockey teammate Ron Stewart. Of course that is just a superficial accounting of the facts. The full-scale investigation by Nassau County Police began on Monday, June 1st. The first statement of any real consequence was issued by the City Deputy Chief Medical Examiner, examiner sorry, uh, Dr. Elliot Gross, who said that the autopsy performed on Terry Sawchuk's body disclosed that he had received a, quote, blunt force injury. It also revealed that Sawchuck had received a laceration of the liver. This one was in addition to the previously known damage to his gallbladder, which had necessitated in its removal. Dr. Gross said that the immediate cause of death was blood clots to both lungs. Detective Sergeant Matthew Bonora of the Nassau Police Homicide Squad said that his men had questioned several witnesses and he confirmed that Ron Stewart, who was at this point back home in uh, Barrie, Ontario, where he lives uh, during the off-season, Ron would be asked to come back to New York to give his version of the events that led to Terry's death. The police also confirmed that Sawchuck himself told them that he fell over Stewart's knee during what he described as horseplay. Terry was taken at his word and the Long Island police who initially began to investigate considered the matter closed and never spoke to Ron Stewart. That all changed with the announcement of Sawchuck's passing. Detective Bonara said that after he had gathered all available evidence that evidence will be turned over to a Nassau District Attorney William Kahn K-A-H-N who would make the decision on whether to refer it to a grand jury. According to a report from United Press International, a New York medical examiner who is not named in their story said that Sawchuk succumbed to a pulmonary embolism after he was transferred to New York Hospital and described the death as, quote, other than natural. Also on Monday, Rangers General Manager Coach Emil Francis said that he spent a good many days over the past month with Terry at the Long Island Hospital. Francis described Sawchuck during this time as not at all depressed about his condition, most of the time talking about next season and how he was looking forward to playing hockey again. Francis was quoted as saying he was full of enthusiasm talking 
about the future. Francis went on to say that a week earlier, Sawchuck had been doing well and a decision was made to transfer him to the New York hospital for tests that were not available to be performed at the Long Island Medical Facility. He said Terry was alert on Friday and that he was aware that another operation had been recommended. That operation was performed on Saturday and Francis said he was told that Terry had had a good night Saturday night. The police conducted their investigation, which included canvassing the neighborhood in which the two men lived to try and shed some light and possibly give some independent corroboration on the story related by Sawchuck and what would eventually be given by Ron Stewart. Stewart was requested by the Nassau County Police to return to New York City and he readily agreed to do so. Uh, the Rangers uh, retained New York attorney Nicholas Castellano and he was uh, instructed to represent Stewart in all proceedings. Castellano issued a statement there had, that there had been no crime committed in this entire situation. At this point in time, the only statement by Stewart had been made to Toronto newspapers and in that statement he said that he was not at all involved in any incident with his friend Terry Sawchuck and that he had planned on calling the Rangers to determine how this rumor had originated. The best version of the events regarding police involvement was given by the ever-reliable Gerald Eskenazi of the New York Times. He spoke with Inspector Joseph Lane, who was in charge of the Long Beach Police Detective Division. Lane said that when reports that Sawchuck had been injured at a bar in Long Island surfaced, he dispatched a detective to the Long Island Hospital to question Terry Sawchuck. That detective was told by Terry that there was no reason to lay any criminal charges in this matter and that his explanation of how he became injured was consistent with other reports that had been attributed to Terry in the media. Because the incident did apparently take place at the home that Sawchuck and Stewart shared and not at the Long Island bar as had been originally and possibly erroneously reported, Inspector Lane said that no further action would be taken since the incident happened outside of his jurisdiction. However, when Sawchuck's condition worsened, Inspector Lane did exactly what he should have done. He immediately notified Nassau County Police of all the information he had learned about this incident. Gerald Eskenazi managed to speak with the landlord who owned the house in which Stewart and Sawchuck lived. They rented this place for, according to the landlord, $225 a month, initially uh, making contact with the landlord through a local rental agency. The landlord, Murray Frischer, said that he had never met Sawchuck and only saw Stewart twice, the final time being when he advised uh, Frischer that he was returning to Canada as had been originally planned. He said Stewart never mentioned any trouble of any sort at that time and the house was left in excellent condition. Stewart had even asked Frischer about renting that same house the next hockey season. On Tuesday, the decision was made to convene a grand jury to decide whether a crime had been committed in relation to the death of Terry Sawchuck. The jury would begin next month, the next Monday and likely would finish hearing evidence by the end of that week. A number of witnesses were going to be subpoenaed, including Emil Francis, several neighbors, Ron Stewart, uh, friends of Terry Sawchuck, and doctors who treated Sawchuk both in the home and at area hospitals. Eskenazi managed to get a very detailed statement from Dr. Dennis Nicholson, whose office is in Long Beach. He had been called to the house by Ron Stewart's fiance, one Rosemary Sasso, after Sawchuk was injured and complained of being in extreme pain. The fiance is a former nurse at the Long Island Hospital and was well known to Dr. Nicholson. Here is what Dr. Nicholson had to say. 
He said, I found Sawchuck in horrible pain. He was in shock. He was pale and had extremely low blood pressure. The shock must have been from all the pain he was suffering. Dr. Nicholson said that they had told him there'd been a fight and that he telephoned the Long Beach Hospital for an ambulance. A few days later, Dr. Nicholson said, when I heard Terry had his gallbladder removed, I visited him in the hospital. Dr. Nicholson said Terry was in bad shape, intravenous feeding, tubes, and an arm draped limply over the side of the bed. Pretty consistent with what Shirley Walton Fischler had reported. Uh, Dr. Nicholson went on to say that Terry had told him that Ron Stewart had been bugging him all year, all hockey season, and he finally had gotten fed up. Uh, he said that Terry told him that I punched him and knocked him down. Terry went on to say, according to Dr. Nicholson, that they had quick kicked both men out of the bar they were at, and Terry had hit Stewart again and just kept knocking him down. Dr. Nicholson said he learned from Terry that the pair drove home in separate cars. And at the house, Sawchuck told him that I tagged Stewart again and knocked him down again. I jumped on him and that's when I fell over his knee. Then Sawchuck added to the story, as told by Dr. Nicholson, I started it and I finished it. On Wednesday, in one of his special to the Toronto Star stories, Stan Fischler reported from a statement made to reporters by Ron Stewart that the altercation with Sawchuck began with an argument over rent. Stewart described the events at least as how he remembered them taking place. Now acknowledging that he was in fact involved in the uh, scuffle that eventually ended Terry's life, Ron said all his lifetime, Terry took much worse falls on the ice and he always bounced back. Then he trips on top of me and suddenly his life has ended. I can't tell you how broken up I am. Ron went on to say uh, that he was basically ready to go out of his mind over the whole thing. He said that the, the thing started with an argument that was really quite stupid. He said they'd rented the house in Long Beach during the season and they were going to move out in a couple of days. So he told Terry that the house had to be cleaned up to leave it in the shape that they found it in when they first got there. Terry didn't like the idea of cleaning things up and basically told Ron to go do something else somewhere else. Uh, Ron said, we, we've got to do this. And anyway, it kept it got out of hand eventually. Uh, they also uh, discussed the amount of rent that was going to be given to the landlord at the end. Terry didn't like the amount Ron suggested, but peeled off the amount he requested and gave it to him and stormed out of the room. Uh, Stewart said that Ben Weiner, a, a mutual friend and one of Terry Sawchuk's few friends in Long Island, uh, actually broke up their scuffle when they got back from the bar. Basically, uh, Ron said that Ben Weiner and some others separated us. Stewart said that when they got home from the bar, uh, Sawchuk of course followed him home and the dispute erupted again on the front lawn. Stewart said at first I couldn't understand what had gotten into Terry but I found out later about the things that were bugging him and I can't tell you how sore I am that I didn't turn away. The guy has some real problems. Stewart explained that his friend Rosemary Sasso had tried to quiet, uh, quiet them down, but she couldn't stop the dispute, and the two started wrestling again. Uh, that's when he recalled that Wiener arrived, and he said that he grabbed Sawchuk from behind, trying to keep him off Stewart. But Terry just kept coming at him. Uh, Ron backed away. He tripped over a metal barbecue that had been lying on the lawn. Uh, it was dark at the time, 1045 at night or somewhere in that area. And uh, Terry came after him and he fell over him and Terry fell over his knee. Ron also speculated that Terry may have struck a, protru a protrusion of some sort from the barbecue and that may have inflicted some damage as well. Stewart said he thought when Sawchuck first was screaming in pain that he was acting and then he soon realized that he wasn't so he told Dr. Uh, or told Rosemary the former nurse to phone Dr. Nicholson who attended the scene and of course we got his version of the events. Ron did say that Sawchuck at first didn't want a doctor because he was afraid the word would leak to his father 
who was in a hospital back home in, in Manitoba after a car accident. But the doctor was called anyway, and Terry was eventually taken to Long Beach Memorial Hospital. On Thursday, Stan Fischler reported on what Could have been speculation, might have had some truth. We really might not ever know. But he reported that Rosemary Sasso had said that Terry Sawchuck had apparently been spitting up blood at some point long before the accident took place. This is days, maybe weeks before. The time frame was never clearly established. This fact was apparently confirmed by Benjamin Weiner, uh, as we mentioned, one of Sawchuck's a few close friends. Sasso said she told Terry to see a doctor about the blood, but he wouldn't hear of it. Weiner said he never saw the spitting of the blood, but Terry had mentioned it to him. There is no official mention of any prior condition that might have contributed to Sawchuck's death at this point in time. Terry Sawchuck's funeral was held Friday, that Friday, in New York City and was attended by Ron Stewart and 10 other Ranger teammates and a good number of other hockey players as well, including several of his teammates while he was with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Ron Stewart was named as an honorary pallbearer for Terry Sawchuck. Will Law cover a little more of this story next week when we see what the grand jury evidence turns out to be and we'll see just what kind of evidence actually is presented because right now we're getting a lot of conjecture we're getting a lot of statements from people who are not under oath and we're getting a lot of hearsay as well we'll see what happens with this case as time goes on we'll stick with it though Well, now let's uh, talk about what we're really all here for, and that's the hockey news this week as teams prepared for next week's NHL meetings in Montreal. Uh, here's some of the items that were being reported as news from the hockey teams as we uh, the week uh, to the meeting progressed. The Boston Bruins got around the name and their new coach a little more quickly than folks thought they would. They tagged assistant general manager Tom Johnson to replace Harry Sinden behind their bench. Now, Tom Johnson spent most of his playing career, a Hall of Fame playing career, by the way, with Montreal Canadiens before finishing up with the Bruins. Tom was famous in his Montreal days as being the defense partner with Doug Harvey. Tom, after his playing days, he ended up with the Bruins. Uh, He moved into the Boston front office as assistant general manager, and he'd been there ever since. Tom takes over coaching the Stanley Cup champions with zero years of coaching experience. There was a ton of speculation about the Minnesota North Stars coaching situation. Uh, They announced that incumbent Charlie Burns, who finished the season as player coach, would not be protected in next week's uh, Buffalo-Vancouver expansion draft. Burns uh, demonstrated during the end of last season he's still a quality NHL player, and so this means that one of Buffalo or Vancouver could draft Charlie to play for them, and that uh, make coaching the North Stars just a bit difficult. By the end of the week, General Manager Ren Blair announced that Burns indeed would not return as coach, but the team would bring him back as a player if he was still their property. Blair said that a new man would be named at the meetings in Montreal next week. Lots of speculation right away on who it might be. One name that immediately popped up was former Penguins coach Red Sullivan, and he immediately removed himself from the running. Another name making the rounds with different hockey writers was former Red Wings coach Bill Gadsby, but Bill has told people he thinks he's done with pro hockey. Ren Blair wouldn't confirm or deny any of the rumors, but he did say he had a man that was definite in his mind that he would name next week. Could that man be Harry Sinden? 
North Stars also announced that they have dropped their Central Hockey League farm team in Waterloo, Iowa. That team lost about $175,000 last year, no small amount for a minor league hockey operation. The Stars recently signed a new working agreement with the Cleveland Barons of the American Hockey League, and you can bet that's where most of Minnesota's minor league chattels are going to end up. Another National Hockey League coaching vacancy was filled this week, and that was the announcement that Al Arbor would take over behind the bench of the St. Louis Blues, replacing Scotty Bowman, who wants to devote all of his efforts to his duties as general manager. Arbor has assured folks he will not be a playing coach. He signed a two-year contract to strictly coach the team, and those teams were not announced. Al Arbor always struck me as a fellow who was fairly cerebral, somebody who probably after his playing days might just make a good coach. We'll have to see if Al takes to coaching as well as he took to blocking shots. The new Vancouver Canucks of the National Hockey League have made a very popular hire in the Canadian West Coast City. Signing on as assistant to the vice president of the Vancouver Canucks is Hall of Fame defenseman Walter Babe Pratt, who makes his year-round home now in Vancouver. He will basically be the assistant to the general manager. With Babe Pratt around the office, I can tell you this, things will never be dull. The National Hockey League Rules Committee has been busy studying ways to improve the game and they're going to make a few proposals at next week's NHL meetings. One idea is to increase monetary fines levied for misconduct, game misconduct, and match penalties. Basically what the Rules Committee wants to do is double the amount of those fines in each case. And here's a rule we'd like to see in action and we'll get to see that in the 1970-71 preseason games, so we're told. It has to do with delay of game penalties, and here's what's going to happen. Instead of assessing a two-minute minor for delay of game when a player or goalie freezes the puck unnecessarily or intentionally shoots the puck out of the rink, the non-offending team will now be given a free face-off. Here's how it's going to work. Uh, the puck will be placed on a face-off dot in a face-off circle in the offending team's defensive zone. The non-offending team will then have the opportunity to play the puck by way of a pass or skating the puck out of the circle without interference from the other team. The only restriction on the play is that the player who is ostensibly taking the face-off may not shoot the puck directly on goal from within the circle. This rule is supposed to be given a try during the exhibition games this fall. Now here I am sitting here 50 years later with people constantly complaining about the automatic puck over the glass rule where if you shoot the puck over the glass in the defensive zone or from the defensive zone in the NHL in 2020, you get an automatic minor penalty. Why not try the free face-off rule? It won't waste an entire two minutes. If it's uh, defended well, it's not going to be an onerous penalty like a full two-minute power play is today. This has got to be better than the travesty we have now in the NHL, doesn't it? I hope an enterprising NHL governor who wants to add some excitement to the game can drum up support for this uh, suggestion if somebody does ever hear this suggestion. The Los Angeles Kings have announced that they have established a working agreement with the Denver Spurs of the Western Hockey League. The Kings will send at least four players to play for Denver next season. Here's a little sad news, although I'm kind of happy for the guy. A veteran National Hockey League referee has announced his retirement from officiating. If you remember, Vern missed a good part of last year's playoffs with what has been described as a gastritis attack, but at the time it was feared 
that he had suffered a pretty bad heart attack. Buffy says his illness has had no effect on his decision to retire. He's just worried about permanent injury with the speed and the roughness of the game today. Vern told reporters that he hopes to land the job somewhere in the hockey world. Here's a story that appeared in the Toronto Globe and Mail this week, and I'm happy to say I had some personal involvement. Uh, at a sports banquet in Dunville on Wednesday evening, Toronto Maple Leafs general manager Jim Gregory and coach John McClellan confirmed that the team will be protecting newly acquired goalkeeper Jacques Plante. Now, I already knew about this story because uh, that athletic banquet at the Dunville High School was my final one of my high school years, and I asked, Jim, that question during a question and answer period we had that night. I don't know how the Global Mail got the story. We didn't think any uh, reporters were present. And the byline on the story just said special to the Globe and Mail. I didn't see Stan Fischler there either. Now, if you're wondering why Jim Gregory, John McClellan might have been at uh, the Dunville High School uh, athletic banquet, Jim is a graduate of Dunville High School. Uh, he knew my, my mom and dad, and I got to know Jim quite well later on in life. But we did meet that night, and when I spoke to him many years later, he actually remembered it, and I was pretty happy about that. Jim brought Johnny McClellan with him, and he also brought along King Clancy and a couple of the players, and it made for a very memorable night for uh, us students at Dunville High School on that warm evening in June 1970. Still with the Maple Leafs, their uh, center, Jimmy Harrison, whom they acquired from Boston last season in the trade for Wayne Carlton. Well, this week, Jimmy showed his truculence could get him in trouble. He was convicted of assault causing bodily harm in a Kamloops, British Columbia court. He was fined $450 and given a six-month sentence in custody, which was suspended by the judge. The charges arose from an incident in which Harrison assaulted a Kamloops man in a local bar this past May 13th. A report in uh, both Vancouver papers uh, this week uh, said that the method by which the first and second choices in the expansion and amateur drafts next week will be done by coin flips, two coin flips. A flip of a coin is going to determine who chooses first. Now, Vancouver General Manager Bud Poyle says that for each coin flip, he plans on flashing a $2 bill at Buffalo General Manager Punch Imlac. Everyone knows just how superstitious Punch Imlac has been through his hockey career, probably his whole life. Well, you also have to know that Punch has always considered $2 bills to be extremely unlucky even to the extent that when given $2 bills in change during any uh, transaction at any business, Punch will return the $2 bill and ask for a pair of ones. Here's a scoop by Pat Curran of the Montreal Gazette this week as he announced that he had learned that Jean Beliveau will definitely be returning to Montreal Canadiens this fall and what wonderful news that is. Curran's source with Beliveau away on a fishing trip in some remote northern Quebec uh, lake was unavailable for comment so his source was none other than than Mrs. Jean Beliveau. Habs general manager Sammy Pollock followed up on Curran's story by saying the Habs would certainly protect Beliveau in the expansion draft. Of course, you know that Punch Imlac, who has always been probably the biggest admirer of Big Jean that there ever was, he'd grab Beliveau in a heartbeat if he were to become available. Jean Beliveau won't be available to Buffalo or Vancouver. Well, we couldn't let a podcast or a week of NHL news from 1970 go by without a dose of the Oakland Seals silliness. It's not hockey news, it's more business news, but it deter- it's, uh, has to do with the ongoing ownership issues for this story franchise and the trial that was going on to try and determine what the heck they were going to do with this team. The week began with Judge Robert Schnacke 
ruling that Transnational Communications of New York had indeed defaulted on four loan payments in recent months. The loan, of course, given so that Transnational could purchase the seals. This is what former owner Barry Van Gerbig, who headed a group called Seals Limited, had alleged in his lawsuit. These loans totaled over $1.6 million. That's $1.6 million, dollars boys and girls. The judge's ruling, in effect, transfers ownership of the SEALs back to the group that sold the team to TNC a couple of years ago. That didn't mean that this thing is anywhere near over, though. It gets complicated, of course. This is the SEALs. How can it not be complicated? The ruling by Judge Snacky was made before final arguments were made in the case. And those final arguments were set back by the judge until June 9th. Now, why would anyone do this? The matter of who ultimately owns the team... Seals Limited says it already has a deal in place to sell it, and what amount will be paid by any prospective buyer is yet to be determined at this point. On June 9th, after those final arguments are made by both sides, the judge is then going to rule whether an offer of $3.4 million by uh, Charles O. Finley, owner of baseball's Oakland Athletics, is commercially reasonable. In other words, the judge is going to determine whether the SEALs will get fair value when they sell the team to Charlie O. Now, I know this is complicated. Stay with me here, and we'll try and uh, relate as the court uh, made its ruling on, on why they're doing what they're doing. During the trial, SEALs' present president, William Creasy, a guy who never met a microphone he doesn't like, he testified that he felt the value of the team was $6 million, which was, of course, the fee charged by the NHL to new Vancouver and Buffalo teams. William felt that the Seals, being an established operation, had to be worth at least that much. Now, of course, what happened was it was learned that the Seals had virtually no money and they were losing upwards of half a million dollars just in their last season. So six million dollars might seem a little high. Given the financial horror stories of the team's operation last year, the judge realizes that Creasy's estimate of the value might not be anywhere near correct. The judge also realized that Finley's offer is likely a low ball, which any savvy business operator would at least want to try. So here's what the judge has decided to do. Although Van Gerbig is going to be listed as the owner, he's given TNC, the Transnational Communications, until that hearing next week where final arguments to be held, are to be uh, made, he's given TNC until June 9th to come up with a buyer that will be better than the offer Finley will make. And Finley's offer, by the way, suddenly went from 3.4 to 4.1 million within 24 hours. So Charlie knows that this judge has a good idea of how to determine value, so he upped his offer right away. So what happens now is the TNC folks can try and find a bidder who will give more value for the team than Charlie Finley does. This should be an interesting week as names surface, if any names surface. Now where does this lead the SEALs hockey operations? Basically, the team right now is in limbo with no budget and absolutely no direction from a vacant top of the uh, organizational chart. The SEALs executive vice president, Bill Torrey, said that he still plans to attend the NHL meetings next week with general manager Frank Selke Jr. and coach Freddie Glover. And in the meantime, they're going to meet amongst themselves to determine their protected list for the expansion draft and also to discuss possible trades and other player moves. They also have to get ready for the amateur drafts as well. Jim Bainbridge of the San Francisco Examiner reported that it was going to be a virtual lock that Finley would take control of the hockey team. The only thing yet to be firmed up would be the final purchase price. 
Now, there was one competitor for Finley in this uh, derby to this to decide who owns the steels and that is roller derby magnet jerry seltzer whose uh, sport is extremely popular in the san francisco bay area he's interested in acquiring the hockey team at the time of the judge's decision seltzer was reported to be in the process of forming a corporation in order to make a viable bid for the seals team but no offer amount has been mentioned technically Anybody with a spare few millions of dollars laying around would be eligible to make a bid. All you have to do is get your ducks in a row and prepare an offer with appropriate financial documentation to prove that you could purchase the team and run it. And all you have to do is do this by next week, June 9th. And that pretty well wraps up the hockey news for the first week of June 1970. And what did we learn this week? Well, we learned more about the circumstances surrounding the death of Terry Sawchuk. Or did we really become more confused about the circumstances surrounding the death of Terry Sawchuk? We'll have to stay tuned for that. We found out the results of that California legal action to determine the ownership of the Oakland Seals. But we learned that this ain't the end of the story, not by a long shot. And we met the new coach of the Boston Bruins and the new coach of the St. Louis Blues in Tom Johnson and Al Arbor. And we found out that the North Stars won't bring Charlie Burns back as coach for sure. And they have a new man in mind who will find out who that is next week. Now with the NHL summer meetings slated to take place in the next week, We're going to have all the news from that, uh, including trades, the expansion draft, the amateur draft, how the order was eventually determined, some bizarre activities that happened around the process by which the order of selection was determined. And that should really be fun. It's going to be a very comprehensive show next week. I might even have to uh, divide it into a couple of uh, episodes because there's a lot going on. We'll also talk about Ron Stewart's appearance before the grand jury investigating Terry Sawchuk's death and what the outcome of those hearings produced. And we'll learn about something pretty interesting that I personally took advantage of right away. Jacques Plant came up with yet another new mask for goalkeepers. And I can personally say that this one looked like a winner. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. I can't thank him enough for all his hard work on this. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto indie rock group Rural Alberta Advantage provides our intro and exit music, and I really hope they get to put on some live shows very, very soon because they're a show well worth attending. Uh, Other musical pieces and sound effects in our podcast are uh, produced by Andy Cole as well. Our research, as we always mention, comes from files from the Toronto Star, the Toronto Globe and Mail, and all the fine publications found at newspapers.com. Don't forget to give a listen to the Council of Council of Dads podcast, which is a new project by Andy Cole, our producer. Each week, Andy and Cole Osborne, with whom he's collaborated on many projects in the past, take an often humorous and semi-serious look at the popular television show, Council of Dads. You ought to give it a listen. You can find us on Twitter at at Hockey50Years and on Facebook under 50 Years Ago in Hockey. We have a WordPress site, Hockey50YearsAgo.com. And, of course, you can get us through your favorite podcast apps. And now we're on YouTube as well. We are enjoying bringing this to you each week. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun throughout the rest of the summer with a few special projects we have in mind. Thanks again, everyone. We will see you next time. When the ice breaks.